Thank you for downloading this Council on Foreign Relations video. CFR is an independent national membership organization and nonpartisan research center. For more information, please visit us online at CFR.org. I'm Ruth Greenspan Bell from World Resources Institute, and it's my pleasure to invite to, uh, to welcome you here this evening. Um, I've been on the other side of this, so I remember the, the ritual council warnings, which are, would you please turn off your cell phone, even if it vibrates, because sometimes it interferes with the, uh, the uh, speaker system. Um, and this uh, meeting is on the record. So our subject this evening is geoengineering. And in some parts of the environmental community, just saying the word geoengineering is a fighting word. It's, uh, it can be very contentious. Um, there, in part, I think this represents um, some fear in some parts of the community that if you start talking about geoengineering, you give up on mitigation, you <coughs> give up on adaptation, and, and just start trying to, try to change the environment. Um, there's, I think, some fear of the impression that there's a magic bullet involved. Um, and I think my own personal concern is that I'm <coughs> kind of worried that when the current climate deniers kind of wake up, at some point and realize something is serious happening here, that they'll be seeking easy fixes. So I'm really, really pleased that the council has chosen to have this conversation today, and particularly with uh, these two speakers who I think are uh, the perfect people to be, to be talking about this. So we will start, we'll have a conversation for about a half hour, and then we'll open it up to questions at that point. Um, I'm not going to repeat the bios that are in the handout that you have. Needless to say, uh, we have two very distinguished speakers. Um, John Steinbrenner is professor of public policy at the University of Maryland and director of the Center for International and Security Studies. And he's been a leading figure for many, many years in uh, arms control and global security. Granger Morgan is professor and head of the Department of Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University, and also for many years has been a leader in helping finding ways to describe scientific uncertainty and incorporate risk into public policy decision making. So we have totally the perfect people here to be talking about this issue. So I wanted to first um, ask Granger to um, sort of set the stage for us and to Tell us, to start from almost a definitional point of view, what is geoengineering and why is this set of issues starting really to be discussed with some degree of seriousness at this po point? What is it in the state of play of climate science and carbon regulation that might be stimulating this discussion? Okay, and we're running the experiment to s tonight to see if an engineer is capable of talking without slides. <laughs> <laughs> We, both John and I have slides that are out there on the uh, table if you want copies of them. I thought actually I should start just a few uh, steps even back from what you described and make sure we're all sort of up to speed on the climate problem. Um, the sun shines on the earth, of course, and uh, about 30% of that light is immediately reflected back into space. And the other 70% uh, is absorbed by clouds, by the surface, by the oceans, and so on. And, the, and of course, if, if that was all that happened, the Earth would rapidly heat up and we'd all fry. Somehow we've got to get the same amount of energy back out into space as, as got absorbed. But once it's absorbed, it can't be re-radiated as light. It has to be re-radiated as heat, as infrared, you know, like, like a radiator heat, uh, radiates. And there's the rub, because the atmosphere, while it's transparent to the visible, uh, is not transparent in the infrared. And so what happens is that the whole temperature of the planet warms a bit, and then finally it gets to a warm enough point that the amount of heat uh, energy radiated off the top of the atmosphere is just equal to the amount that's being absorbed, and so the planet runs in equilibrium. And that's a good thing for us. This is the so-called greenhouse effect. And if it weren't for that, it would not, planet Earth would not be a, a terribly pleasant place to be. Uh, 
the two principal constituents in the atmosphere that absorb infrared are water vapor and carbon dioxide. And uh, we have, for several hundred years now, been gradually increasing the concentration of carbon dioxide. And as a consequence, the uh, uh, mean temperature, or the average temperature at which the planet operates, goes up. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, so that's all kind of theoretical. And in, in the slides, one of the things you will see is a picture of a couple thousand megawatt coal-fired power plant just west of where I live. Uh, called the Bruce Manfield Power Station. A plant that size uses a couple hundred of these large hundred-ton hopper cars of coal every day. And so to give it sort of a more concrete sense, a plant like that takes a, uh, a couple hundred, you know, a train of, of 200 cars, turns it into an invisible gas, puts it into the atmosphere every day, and we're doing that in hundreds of facilities like that all around the world. So the, though it's invisible, the, the mass volumes are, are quite large. The one other thing I should say about the physics or the science is that unlike conventional pollutants, unlike, say, sulfur dioxide, oxides of nitrogen, which when you put them in the atmosphere only stay there for a few hours or days, uh, so if I stopped emitting uh, sulfur dioxide, it would rapidly disappear, or if I stabilized emissions, concentrations would stabilize. Uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases aren't like that. They live in the atmosphere, many of them, for 100 years or more, with the result that it's kind of like a big bathtub. If I had a bathtub with a small drain and a big faucet, you know, unless I really close down the faucet, the bathtub will continue to fill up. And so think of the atmosphere as like that bathtub. And unless I dramatically reduce emissions by 80% or so globally, um, the level of concentration or the concentration in, of CO2 in the atmosphere will continue to rise. All right, that's, that's all the, uh, the science. But, I, but since it turns out many people do not understand this cumulative effect and the fact that one really does need to dramatically reduce emissions in order to stabilize concentration, I've started making a point of, of talking about this whenever I talk about climate issues. At Carnegie Mellon, we've been doing a variety of things on uh, uh, climate impact assessment and integrated assessment of climate problems for many years. When we first got started, we looked sort of systematically across the whole space, and one of the things we did was get a young postdoc, uh, David Keith, to do quite an extensive review of geoengineering. It's an idea uh, by which I mainly mean changing the albedo, that is the fraction of, of sunlight that's reflected back to space. I told you it was about 30%. So this is not a new idea. People have been talking about it sort of on the fringes of the science community for many, many years. And we did a review, and then we set it aside. Like many others, we were rather reluctant to work too seriously on the problem, in part because you know, you're sort of concerned that, that knowledge might drive intention. That is, that if, if you get to the point you really know how to do this and you know what it would cost and so on, that that might raise the likelihood that somebody would do it. So for, I don't know, 15 years or more, having done a set of fairly comprehensive reviews, we didn't work on it anymore. But then about three years ago, given the really abysmal progress that the rest of the you know, the U.S. and all the rest of the world are making in terms of, of reducing emissions, I began to get concerned, among other things, that, that somebody might wake up one day and say, oh my God, we got a problem. I mean, the Chinese, for example, might conclude because of changes in precipitation, we can't feed our people. Or Russia might conclude that uh, all of Siberia is turning, with the, with the permafrost thawing, is turning into an impenetrable bog. And so I got worried a bit about the prospect that somebody might, or some small group of folks, might go off and unilaterally just start doing this, having concluded we got a problem, we got to fix it. And at that stage, I decided maybe the foreign policy community should start uh, thinking about this issue. So three of us at Carnegie Mellon on the technical side, and John and David Victor on the political science side, got together and 